Good afternoon and welcome to today's new episode of the Mary Trump Show Strategy Sessions. Uh, we're changing things up a bit. Uh, we're going live, obviously, at 12 noon Eastern instead of 7 p.m. And um, because uh, during the hearings, we had such an amazing group of people to talk us through it, we're, we're going to recreate that magic for our strategy sessions and um, hopefully have a thing or two to talk about. So uh, starting me off is uh, Dahlia Lithwick. Dahlia, thank you so much for being here. Uh, so <laughs> the strategy sessions, as, as most of you watching know, are about helping us understand what's at stake uh, in these upcoming midterm elections, what is, um, you know, the headwinds Democrats are facing, why such headwinds exist, and also looking at them in the context of these really earth shattering events that are occurring in America today, uh, both politically, legislatively, um, judicially. Uh, in, in the context of these January 6th select committee hearings, and of course, uh, in the context of the fact that we now have a rogue, illegitimate, um, extremist, reactionary, we can just keep adding uh, awful adjectives all day long, Dahlia, uh, Supreme Court that is essentially um, making it impossible <laughs> to uh, live in a democracy anymore. Is that overstating it? Uh, it's not only not overstating it, Mary, I, I feel as though we're in such a blender that the sense that if you pay attention to one thing, you almost physically cannot register the other stuff is so acute. And one of the things that I keep saying is that the hyper focus on the Dobbs decision means yes. that folks kind of miss that that wasn't the only consequential decision of the term. It might not even ultimately be the most consequential uh, decision, and we'll get to that. But I think that it's just so um, not in our nature to be able to sort of laser focus on 16 things at once. And the fact that the court upended, you know, in some case, decades of precedent in not one case, but four or five, almost is too much to register. And that that's not even counting, you know, January 6th, that's not even counting uh, the big lie. Yeah, I, I'm really glad you, you put it in that, framed it that way, because it is very true that this one decision, although awful, highly consequential and far reaching uh, has served to as cover for some other equally and as you said in some cases more egregious and consequential rulings i mean the the one about west virginia versus epa loops to mind but you know we will get to um all of that um i i want though to just stay with this concept of uh, flooding the zone as strategy. Um, we live in a time right now where this country is at the mercy of stochastic terrorists or uh, you know, people who are engaging in stochastic terrorism. And it, it, it has that same feeling. You don't know where to turn. You don't know where to find cover. You don't know what's safe anymore or where it's safe or who to trust. And as much as I don't like to give Donald credit for anything, um, one thing I do think he's responsible for is just this idea that if you just keep committing crimes or engaging in unconstitutional behavior to such a degree, people can't keep up, people can't focus, and they lose sight of what really matters and what's really going on. Um, you know, I think that's one of the things the January 6th committee hearings have done so well. They've really laid out just how deep, widespread, and organized it all was. So it might seem uh, that there is 
this sort of random uh, barrage being thrown at us, but it doesn't, it, when you dig deep, it really isn't random at all, is it? It's not random, Mary. And I think that the stochastic terror is so purposive. I mean, I think that one of the things that we didn't all clock, even when Ruby Freeman testified, is the degree to which the point was to name her. The point was to dox her. The right. point was to have people show up at her grandmother's house, you know, order pizzas there. Like the point mm -hmm. isn't simply to terrorize election workers. Um, it's to weaponize the fear so that everybody else leaves. And I thought that one of the moments in her hearing that didn't get nearly enough um, airtime was when they said, did anyone else who worked with you that day stay on? in their capacity as an election worker. And she said, of course not. And I think that the other piece of this that I think is really essential, Mary, and it's worth surfacing, is the degree to which vigilantism is becoming a part of the stochastic terror. And so I think that, and this is why, you know, yesterday's horrific uh, events in Illinois are so shocking. It's why the court's ruling in the in the Bruin case, the guns case, is as consequential, as you uh, noted, as the Dobbs decision. Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the things that if you blinked, you missed with Texas's SB8 bill, which was the first vigilante abortion bill, uh, the early ban that the court let go into effect on September 1st in Texas, is the degree to which if you conscript citizens, Uber drivers and neighbors and folks who work at clinics, and you tell all of them that they have the force of law to enforce a law that by the way, state actors cannot enforce. The really scary thing about SB8 wasn't just that they changed it to a pre-viability ban. That was shocking. It's that when you deputize everyone in the country, across state lines, by the way, which is what you're going to now see in the abortion context, mm -hmm. to enforce the law as they see fit, that's Kyle Rittenhouse territory. And I think that's the part of stochastic terror that we just need to pull on because it's not just inciting the Proud Boys. It's persuading everyone that if everything is broken and lawless, they should take up arms and enforce the law as they see fit. And that's an extension of terrorism, vigilantism, that I don't think we've paid nearly enough attention to this year. Hi, Waj. Hey, how's it going, everyone? Hope you had a well, day. July exactly. Where you weren't dodging bullets? Yeah, uh, we, we're basically kind of taking a step back because um, we, we do want to talk about what's happening with the Supreme Court, but you know, Dolly and I have just been been discussing the this sense that this is this is a broader project. Um, we're we're putting in the context of stochastic terrorism. Mm. Dahlia pointed out um, quite rightly that one of the um, a related issue that we're going to be dealing with, thanks uh, in large part to the Supreme Court and its ruling on SB8 in Texas, is vigilantism and empowering individuals like Kyle Rat, Rat whatever his name is, uh, the double murderer, Rittenhouse. Uh, Kyle Rittenhouse, Rittenhouse. Yeah. Um, not just empowering them uh, to um, commit crimes that serve a, a, an agenda, but then to um, lift them up to heroize them, which is just absolutely insane. Uh, and you know, inspire others. Uh, I don't think it's an accident that this, the gunman in Highland Park, Illinois was, as far as I'm aware, a maggot. Um, so Waj, here we are. Um, I, I didn't think there was much to celebrate going into yesterday anyway. Um, but now we had, I, I don't, I lost count of how many mass shootings there were yesterday. It was a four. Um, the last in my count was four. four? But probably okay. more. Let's that's, see. That's um, what do you, I? You know, that's America. That is America now. That is American now. Mm. And we are constantly. It feels and and Dahlia pointed this out at the very beginning. We're constantly dealing with so much. 
-hmm. that it's impossible to focus on one thing, or we mm -hmm. focus on one thing at the exclusion of all of the other many, many, many important things that are going on that are also eroding mm -hmm. um, our, our safety, our democracy, and um, our ability to live, <laughs> have liberty, and pursue happiness. Uh, so what's, what is your take on this whole idea of uh, this sort of being part of a project mm. uh, on the right? But other than that, things are going wonderful. Uh, yeah. So thank you all for joining yeah. us. But I, I agree to break all, each point down. You know, I've been trying to write about this uh, for a while, and I try to use these three individuals and I group them, right? Uh, Kyle Rittenhouse. Uh, Mark McCloskey, who people forget, but I'll remind mm -hmm. you in a second, and also yeah. Eddie Gallagher. So Eddie Gallagher was the Navy SEAL psychopath who was a war criminal right. whose own soldiers testified against him, but Donald Trump pardoned him, and then he became a right-wing hero. Mark McCloskey was the, the broke Bonnie and Clyde with the pink polo shirt with him and his wife who took out the guns against the peaceful BLM protesters in St. Louis and all the black protesters are like, what are you doing? And that wasn't a crime. It was a like illegal brandishment of weapons. He was pardoned by the Republican governor and now he's running for Senate. And he was the one who got this amazing, if you remember the 2020 Republican National Convention, which had no platform, by the way, but they got five minutes of amazing real estate. They made it look like a movie. Him and his wife sitting there addressing the nation, repeating many of the talking points of birth of a nation, of the coming yeah. for the suburbs. Uh, then you have Kyle Rittenhouse, and yeah, I'll, I'll add another one, Ashley Babbitt. Yeah. So the trend here, and then also when Donald Trump was asked very specifically on the debate stage with Biden, can you condemn white supremacy? Like three times in a row, this, this meatball down the middle by Chris Wallace, right? Refused to do it, and he told the Proud Boys to stand back and stand by. And one of the many bombshells that have been dropped in the six hearings the first day was the, the the collusion of the proud boys and the oath keepers with roger stone and people from the trump administration people are forgetting that right now right so when when trump's told the proud boy to stand back and stand stand back and stand by they took him literally and seriously mm -hmm. and so my fear here is not only are they empowering and emboldening their own militia this is what happens in fascism right their own their own brown shirts Yep. is that the brown shirts, the, the MAGA shirts or the maggots, as you call them, know that once they get power politically, my people, just like the Klan back in the day, will let me go free. The sheriff's on my side, the lead foreman's on my side, the bailiff's on my side, the judge is on my side. They all wear hoods. So I could be like a Kyle Rittenhouse and show up. We know that law enforcement is, I'm sorry to say this, but a lot of them are right wing. You know, they just remember Kyle Rittenhouse brought the gun, killed two people, went up to the police officers, they thanked him. And so what we're going to see, my fear is in the case that, and we've talked about this, this this upcoming case, Dahlia, the name of it, you know, the one with state legislatures looking over the uh, elections. Uh, the independent state legislature theory. There you go. It's yeah, more, we're going to get yeah. there. For more, sure. Yeah, I mean, I'm just saying that's the, the reason mm -hmm. I'm going to mention that is that's the case. As you, if you're talking about this big project, Mary. They're right, they're, we're witnessing a right-wing judicial coup, but that case that Dali just mentioned is the case that I, I think they should be blared nonstop 24-7 because that's the case that will be the end result of this ongoing right-wing coup where the Supreme Court will give the power to state legislatures to overturn the will of the popular people. Once that happens in 2022, and I'll end my little rant here, once that happens in 2022, for the 2024 election is going to come down to the four or five states that we know pennsylvania wisconsin michigan arizona georgia nevada probably those republican state legislatures will say bye bye to the the majority put in their republican electors now we have a constitutional crisis in that constitutional crisis who's going to come out with guns and crack the skulls of the rest of us who are out in the streets and i just wanted to connect the dots for the people when when, when people say oh these are just disparate things no no it's all part of a concentrated plan because people are forgetting that this coup was not in the past. This is an ongoing coup. Yes. Um, and just to remind people, uh, McCloskey, they literally, they they weren't protesting outside of that. They were walking down the street. Walking. So, you know, nobody was even doing anything to these people. They were just walking through the neighborhood while black, admittedly. So that was the problem. So I think that the case is uh, more v something. Um, I don't remember, but anyway, we, we will get to that later because I think that is, that is where all of this is trending. 
Um, but I, I want to um, put all of this uh, or talk about all of this in terms of the midterms, because that's, you know, that's what we're here for with the strategy sessions, because everybody's so overwhelmed. Um, you know, and, and again, one of the things that I, I find endlessly fascinating is that what energizes them is meant to demoralize and enervate the rest of us because, you know, we don't like cruelty. We don't like violence. We don't like people uh, having their rights stripped away or being, we don't like having our children murdered in classrooms all the time. Um, so we it also, though, of course, feels that uh, not feels that it's true that the majority uh, has no say anymore. We're, we have no voice anymore. So one of the things that just as a human being, I find so mind blowing is that all of these things are happening deliberately. Um, you know, there there's practically nothing being done about guns. And don't get me wrong, the closing of the boyfriend loophole, although by the way, it's not, it wasn't as, as uh, far reaching as people might think. It was very done in a very specific way. And the burden is almost impossible <laughs> to overcome, but it's not nothing, you know, it's not nothing. Um, but very little be, is being done um, about guns. Uh, we have, I think a gubernatorial candidate in Illinois for a Republican, obviously saying after this horrific mass shooting on a parade, children were shot and hospitalized. I don't know how many people are dead right now. I think it's six to eight, 40, 50 people in the hospital. Very shortly after this happens, he's like, yeah, okay, move on. Let's celebrate the 4th of July. You know, just, just the, 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 uh, the sociopathy. Uh, it's not just lack of empathy anymore. It's a sociopathy just riddled. This party is riddled with it at this point. Um, we have the fact that police now have been emboldened to trample even further upon people's rights. A black man was shot 60, 90 times. I don't know for nothing. Shot, uh, shot at 90 times, hit shot, 60 times. Hit 60 times. Um, you know, I guess that that 60th bullet was the trick. I, I mean, he wasn't armed. I was a, Anyway, well, and these know. white shooters recently, including not just the the, the maggot uh, who killed six people, but also if you see in Kentucky, that white shooter yep. who killed three cops. Yep. People forget that story. He was taken in alive. That's right. Uh, as of course was the white Highland Park shooter. Um, so we have uh, obviously now half of the country is now sec second class citizens. Um, the extent to which they're going after LGBTQ plus community, um, the, the danger that trans people face is just increasing exponentially on an almost daily basis. Uh, I could go on and on. And I, I think the, the, uh, the two other things, of course, is that, that uh, they are imposing their ideas about what gun rights are on states that actually have sane gun safety legislation like New York. So that's, that's disturbing and dangerous. And of course, you know, the EPA decision, uh, which endangers the entire planet. So against this backdrop, how is it possible that, you know, conventional wisdom is that Democrats will probably lose in the midterms. I mean, what the fuck, Seriously, what the fuck else needs to happen? What because again, a balanced against all of that is inflation and high gas prices, both things over which the president of the United States has no control. Please help me understand this because that's one of the well, many, many, many things that keeps me up at night. Dahlia, am I am I wrong to feel like I'm going crazy? No, you're not wrong. Let's get to it in a second. I, I want to add one gloss to what Waj just said, which is, I think, incredibly important about the lawlessness and the vigilantism and the sense that particularly if you're a white man, you are always empowered to go anywhere uh, you want with a weapon. And increasingly, right. uh, you're going to be allowed to go wherever you want uh, with multiple weapons. And uh, one of the things that I thought was really interesting after yesterday's uh, 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 massacre at the parade 
Heidi Lee Feldman, uh, who teaches at Georgetown, had a really interesting Twitter thread where she talked about the ways in which the cultural sort of absorption of that moment was to say, okay, I guess we just don't go to parades anymore. Like we've now stipulated, we don't go to, you know, we don't go to public events, we don't go to marches, and now we don't go to 4th of July parades. And I just think it, it, it really is a one-way ratchet where we are being, in addition, I think, to being numbed, Mary, and like asked to normalize and integrate that which is unthinkable, I think the other thing that happens is we're seeding public spaces. Right. Uh, we're saying, you know, okay, well, maybe, you know, if I just stay in my basement, I homeschool my kids and only hang out with people exactly like me and never exchange an idea with someone I don't agree with, uh, I will be safe. And I just want to really um, make this point that Heidi, I think, made so el eloquently in her little uh, tweet storm about it, which is the nature of democracy is that if you do not go into public spaces and talk to people who are not like you, and if you do not feel like you are safe at your polling places, at your places of worship, uh, at your kid's school, then democracy collapses. Right. And that's kind of the point, that's right? The point. There's a side fight in the Bruin decision, and we can talk about it, about what are going to be sort of like now like special protected spaces. And New York is trying now to just sweep up everything into uh, these dangerous places. Mm -hmm. But that's not the point. The right. point is, if some people, and Wash said this, I'm just going to say it again. If Proud Boys can walk through Boston and feel complete impunity mm. and feel as though they own the streets, and the answer is to seed the streets to them, you're creating a self-fulfilling prophecy there you go. where not yeah. just uh, do the people who have arms and the people who feel that the police are on their side are emboldened, but you're creating another class of people who are hiding in their basements. And I right. just think it's such an important piece of the vigilantism and the terrorism that we don't always track that Justice Alito, when you read his Bruin opinion, makes it sound as though he's got massive solicitude for the poor you know, office cleaner in New York who's a person of color who wants to take the subway and all of the criminals are armed and he's the only one who isn't armed. But that's a one-way ratchet uh, yeah. that leads to everyone, everyone yeah. being armed and everyone else staying home. Exactly. And like, no, I wanna get to the voting piece, but I just wanna make that point because I think it's really essential. Absolutely. And I want to pause there for one second. First, I want to welcome cub reporter Brian Karam, who I believe is on, on site at the White House, in the soup, as he says. Hi, Brian. Hey, good to see everybody. Good to see you. Um, we're, we're talking about stochastic terrorism and um, the, the fact that despite all the horrors that uh, the right wing is inflicting upon this country, that the, the midterms are still in, in question. So Dahlia is going to answer that question and then we'll get to you, Brian. But Dahlia, before, before you continue, I also wanted to add a couple of things. The other thing that's going on um, is that uh, I, I've been thinking a lot about Cheryl and Eiffel's book um, on the courthouse lawn and, and when Waj said that law enforcement is largely uh, right wing, uh, yes, they are. And which kind of surprised, I would think it, at least in terms of gun safety issues, they wouldn't be, but they are. I guess it's the same thing that's going on uh, in the broader, uh, in the country at large, is that people who you know think the second amendment is the most important thing in the universe are perfectly willing to sacrifice people to uh, their need for guns, um, including our children and including police officers. Uh, so just this idea that um, these lynching is on the rise and it feels again that the entire system is uh, involved in the endangering of black Americans. And it's it that's another thing that feels like a huge step back. I mean, I cannot, I just can't, I'm, it feels like we're heading back to Jim Crow territory. And uh, Dahlia, I, at least I recently heard your interview with the amazing Dorothy Roberts, um, who's two, two of whose books I've read that everybody should read, Killing the Black Body and Torn Apart. And it does feel, it's totally systematic. 
you know, from conception on down. Uh, so, so that's another issue that's, I mean, that's been going on for a very long time, but again, everything seems to be accelerating at such an alarming pace. Uh, and then in terms of, you know, their, their whole, an armed society is a polite society bullshit. Um, you're right. We, we are getting, uh, the spaces in which we are allowed are shrinking. And I hear some people on the left say, well, you know, just wait until a, a Jew or a Muslim tries to pray on the 50 yard line or wait until, you know, a group of, of people of color start walking around town and with AR 15s. First of all, um, I please don't do that because it won't end well for you. And secondly, that is again, the wrong, that's the wrong response. We don't want anybody doing these things. Uh, so I just wanted to add those, those couple of, uh, points. Um, and we don't want them doing it because nobody should be walking around the country in our streets with, with weapons of war, first of all. And secondly, there is a separation between church and state, at least theoretically. So let's not a a aid in eroding it even further than this SCOTUS has done already. So anyway, Don, um, the insanity of, of worrying that uh, <laughs> the Democrats might lose when, by rights, they should win every race they're in at this point. Look, this is a really hard seam we're living on, Mary, and, and you and I have talked about it before, even on this show, that I think in some sense, Democrats are both reasonably frustrated that the only message coming from Joe Biden is vote, and quite horrified, by the way, at the folks who used photographs of massacre victims yesterday to try to say, this means you should vote, right? I think at one level, oh, it fe feels opportunistic and crass and horrible. I do think it really goes to how completely screwed we are that voting, voting in massive, massive numbers uh, and really showing up and bringing 20 people to the poll kind of is uh, the only, once you've lost the courts, once you've lost um, legislatures in 30 states that are going to, as we just heard, uh, try to impose uh, fake electors in some of those states uh, in the 2024 election. That's the plan uh, that Rudy Giuliani got disbarred for. That's the thing that John Eastman was trying to sell to a White House that full of lawyers who told him it was garbage. That's the theory in more in this North Carolina case that the court just granted cert on. So it really sucks to be told, keep voting, keep voting, when you stop and think about the fact that black women voters are the reason the Georgia Senate race went the way it did. I mean, people who have been voting and voting and voting and organizing do not like to be told to vote when it doesn't seem as though their elected officials had any plan any plan after a year of seeing that Dobbs was coming. But I do think in a really, really sad way, us being mad at ourselves is not the answer right now. Right. <laughs> the answer is that the alternative is straight up authoritarianism. It's straight up fascism. And so like, yes, by all means, be pissed off. I am pissed off that Ray Roe is not codified. But I think if you think the answer is to stay home or like I said, seed your streets and live in your basement, and hope this gets better. I really, really think, and I cannot say this more strongly, we are at a break the glass moment. We were at one before 2020 and by the skin of our teeth, like we like to say, oh, the system held, the system held. There are about four parts of the system that were like duct tape and MacGyvered together that held. But like, I think having confidence that the system is gonna hold the next time when the court has agreed to hear what is without a doubt the most consequential voting case of our lifetimes puts Bush v. Gore in the dust. And I think if we don't realize that we have to vote the Nothing shit now. out of that, then we're in big, big trouble. Yeah. And and I and by the way, it, it, at many points, it wasn't the system. It was a single individual. And in one case, it was a 23 year old woman. So, you know, I think if the system had held we wouldn't be worse off now than we were uh, in November, 2020. So that's important. Brian, I want to talk about this idea of the solution is voting because the solution is always voting. I mean, you know, I, I, I think well, that uh, very well. 
it is very frustrating when people are like, you know, I voted already. Well, you know, it's a democracy for Christ's sakes. It's not a, it, it, it's not an end result. It's a process. We always have to vote until we die if we if we live in a democracy because that's how it works. We need to. That is a right and it is a privilege. Um, and uh, the problem is that you know, one, not enough people vote, and two, way too many people, thanks to John Roberts, aren't allowed to vote anymore. Um, but to Dahlia's point, Brian, the issue is that sometimes you really do need to give people a reason and. Not everybody understands to the degree that those of us with the luxury, if you want to call it that anymore, luxury or burden of having to pay attention, they don't know autocracy versus democracy. I mean, I think most people don't quite understand really what their relationship to democracy is. Most people don't know autocracy. This is America. What are you talking about? It's Republicans. It's Democrats. So you really do need to say to them, this is what we will do. And again, I, generally speaking, pull my punches when it comes to criticizing Democrats on policy issues. One, because we don't need the negativity. I think how much worse it would be if Biden had lost. So we can deal with that when things kind of are, we're on safer ground. The purpose of this, however, is offering constructive criticism to Democrats so we don't fucking lose everything in November. So Brian, what... What in your view, because you know you're you're there every day, what it what is keeping elected Democrats from either recognizing the danger we're in or summoning the fortitude to play hardball? <laughs> well, that's a good question. First, let me give you a little bit of news. We just came out of uh, uh, the East Room where the president was asked. We asked him if he was going to go to Highland Park. He says he doesn't know. So. He, we'll pr presumably get an update on that throughout the afternoon, and we'll let you know if we do. Uh, secondly, as to your second question, um, look, um, that's one of the big problems we have with the, it's, you know, Donald Trump had nothing to say and said it all the time. And um, <laughs> I have a lot to say it very much. And it was um, covered every day. Look, it, it, it was one statement that was put out. Uh, on Friday, I think, by the Biden administration about how um, it's uh, it, it's um, the problem of Mitch McConnell in Kentucky protecting big pharma and using China and hurting uh, uh, job opportunities in the United States to defend big pharma in China. That should if that had been a Donald Trump tweet, we'd have been covering it twenty four seven. They put it out as a press statement. Nobody's out. Look, I'm I'm on the North uh, Lawn now. There's nobody out here. During the Trump administration, there'd be people walking up out of the Oval all the time, going on TV, talking to reporters, getting their word out. The Democrats think that just because they're different from Donald, they're not Donald, and they're better than Donald. But nobody hears them. I mean, we're basically, the President of the United States just left an East Room function. There's no one going live. There's nothing behind me. No one at the six, where there used to be during the Trump administration. The Democrats simply, like I said, there's two parties in this country, one of one, no heart and one of no head. The Democrats have no head for the fight. They don't have anybody who's trumpeting their message out live. And that's the biggest problem that they have. They're being overrun by Donald Trump, who won't shut up, although he's got nothing to say. And that's if the Democrats, I, you know, the question I asked the president as he was leaving today that he just shook his head to, I said, are you concerned about your party's performance in the coming midterms? And there was, he just shook his head. That should be forefront, should be part of everything that they're talking about every day. And they should be what it is that they've done better than Donald Trump, and they haven't. The simple fact of the matter is the Democrats are in the White House, but it still feels like for many people that Donald Trump is because he takes up so much oxygen in the room, which is why the January 6th hearings, in a way, are good for Donald Trump, because he doesn't mind. He's still in the news. That's what he wants. And until the Democrats understand that they're in a fight, I don't know how well they're going to do. Breathe. <laughs> Breathe. <laughs> um, well, all the, these are all the uh, booths. If you look behind me, being operated there's a normal day in the white house during trump all of this there'd be people right here there'd be people there's not even one person going live there's nothing 
going on here. Although the president of the United States just bestowed four Medal of Honors on people from the Vietnam War, and they're talking about the problems going on in Highland Park, and they're talking about the, the, you know, everything that this country's facing, but where are the people in this administration talking? Where? They're not. Okay, so Waj, that's a problem. And the, you know, one of the reasons it's a problem is because I don't know how we do anything about that. Uh, a Well, so talk to the Biden administration and tell them to open up their mouth a little more often and put their people on TV. But I'll they get right are, on they, that. How do we, I mean, how do we do that? I mean, seriously, like, yeah. I, don't, I don't know anybody. I, <clears throat> I, as far as I know, nobody here has any special connections. I don't have a bat phone. I mean, you know. Yes. All right, so Brian, get on your bat phone. Um, I'm sorry. Is is that a, a bad reference for a nerd inventor to use? No, no, it's fine. We we could do crossover. <laughs> okay, all right, we're gonna do crossover. It's a bipartisanship. Uh, we uh, we need everything we can get. But large, I mean, there's also an ancillary or related problem is that uh, Democrats in Congress aren't doing this either. Now, Liz Cheney, who uh, for a lot on the left has become a hero, which is mind blowing, is is on video basically saying that Democrats are killing babies. Yep. Um, is yeah. this somebody we need to be polite to? <laughs> I mean, they call us pedophiles. They call us groomers. They tell us, tell, tell people we're murdering babies right mm. after they're born, which by the way, only an insane person would say, or an incredibly craven person would say, I think, I think, I don't, I don't know about Liz Cheney's state of mental health, but it's obscene either way. And yet we cannot summon the right. will to be rude to, or we're worried about being rude because they're 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 their colleagues. I mean that's something else that I'm beginning to lose a lot of patience with. Well you see that every institution in America, including our institutions, the media institutions, bend the knee to bad faith right wing politics and what they call working the refs, because the right wing always whines and complains that they're the victims and every single media institution, I could tell you as a person who wor works in these institutions, bends the knee to them like Charlie Brown does to Lucy, says, Okay, if we just let if you be, if you become a columnist, will you stop hating us? And they're like, No, no, we'll call you the enemy of the people and radicalize our base to kill you. Okay, wonderful. We'll give you a column. And what I've said before, and it, and, it, and it might seem too harsh, is that in America, fascism will be welcomed as long as it's good for ratings, it's profitable, and gives us access to power. Fascism will be embraced. And every single institution is bending the knee to this bad faith right wing attack on our democracy under this old, outdated both sides model, which, by the way, has been BS forever. Well, you got to cover both sides. No, you don't. I, and I'm telling you for people who are listening right now in the in the media, there are people it's almost like they're trained and they can't untrain themselves like producers, uh, editors. They're like, no, no, but we need both sides. We gave seven minutes to to Mick Mulvaney. Now we have to give seven minutes to the other side. And these are choices that institutions make. You know, you make a choice to run certain op-eds that equates the left and the right together. You know, trans language is the same as women losing 50 years of rights. I'm talking about the New York Times and Pamela Paul, who wrote that atrocious uh, New York Times op-ed, right? Uh, the decision by CBS to hire Mick Mulvaney, the decision by ABC to hire Chris Christie. So to, to tie the threads together, you know, Dahlia mentioned how we're uh, we're seeding the ground. The, the architecture of the Republican Party and the, the the strategy is to apply pressure, school boards, medical boards, ele uh, election poll workers, democracy. They will terrorize us. They will intimidate us. We will seed the ground. It's happening across the board. We seed the ground. They take over. And then people say, I did everything. I voted. I, I, I braved COVID. What happened? And Democrats are in power and they're not fighting. Both sides are the same. You're seeing this now. Slight depression in votes. It's enough for the Republicans to come back, get the House, get the Senate. And most average Joes and Jose's and Janes, they're not like us. They're not, they're not nerds. They're like Biden's president. How come he's not fighting back? I voted for him. Eh, I'll go vote for Republicans. Now the vote's depressed. Republicans run the show. This is where, when it comes to strategy, you need a united, if you're going to use the word united, institutional majority resistance at every single level. You have to resist fascism at every single level. So that means 
the people on the streets, that means at the local level, that means our media institutions who will fail us. I'm going to give you a warning. They're going to fail us. But also for Democrats, I'm going to give you an example. Since it's about strategy sessions, Democrats who did it right. Uh, Pritzker, governor of Illinois, yes. yesterday. Gavin Newsom with his ad in Florida. Uh, the state senator, uh, uh, Mallory uh, McMorrow. Yeah. AOC on Stephen Colbert. That should have been the Biden party. That should be Kamala Harris. People want to see a fight. And if you don't tell people the threat, they won't know the threat. If you don't tell people how to save democracy, they won't know how to save democracy. If you don't tell people what to do, they won't know. Here's an example where after the Highland shooting, if I was in the Biden administration, I would have been Joe Biden today, gone on, addressed the nation and spent seven minutes blasting Republicans. Yep. Literally, I would have been like, where are my Republican colleagues? Why are they OK with this? Ask your Republicans. Are they fine with more dead kids? I would run an ad with saying Republicans love uh, guns more than they love our children. I, that should be ad number one. The second ad I would run from now until 2024, and I'll, I'll quickly explain why, is are Republicans okay with a 10 year old girl who was raped carrying her baby? Ask every Republican. Like, it would be the almost like the Willie Horton moment, the mm -hmm. horrible ad that Atwater did, which is super racist, but this time it's actually real. Yep. A specific story. And it's something which Republicans are stuck. Because the answer is, yes, we want a 10-year-old girl who was raped to carry her baby. And if the Republicans say, no, no, we're against it, the base will turn against them. You have a win right now with that one story. That happened, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, this 10-year-old girl, because she sought an abortion at six months and three days, they said, no, nope, you're three days late. She had to go over to Indiana. Because there's zero exceptions for rape and, and incest in this new anti-abortion law. The polls say you have a win on women's rights. The polls say you have a win. On January 6th, the polls say you have a win on guns, right? Even with Latinos and, and many gun owners, African-American gun owners, the, the polls say you have a win on book bans. Where is the messaging by the Democrats? It's not there. And so the, that's the strategy that I would do on these two issues. I would wage into the culture war on women's rights and guns, especially right now. You have a win for the next two years. But if you have no message and you have no messengers, who's going to find out about it? And what they do is they trot out AOC as a guinea pig. Let's see what AOC does on Stephen Colbert. Oh, people like that. OK, let me do it now. And so to connect the thread of what we can do, I'll say this, ladies and gentlemen, pressure works. Pressure works. If you pressure your politicians, politicians move their ass. And I get hit on Twitter when I criticize the Biden administration because people are saying, oh, they make all these assumptions about you and me, you know, like, oh, you're a third party voter. You said don't vote for Clinton. I'm like, what are you talking about? Wait, I'm just criticizing the Democrats for wanting to do more. Once the pressure came on them, you saw the last week, finally Biden came out and said the radical idea that we've been seeing for a couple of years, Mary, which was we got to end the filibuster. How did that happen? Pressure. So for the rest of us watching right now, your job is to pressure your elected officials to fight. And then we have the resources to actually take it back. And, and finally, what Dahlia said, unfortunately, what we have right now, because of the historical trends of elections, because of the ongoing coup by the right wing, because of voter suppressions, it will take mass institutional resistance, which won't be there. The way I'm just giving you a heads up, ladies and gentlemen, fascism will be welcomed in America, at least in the, in the beginning. But we need the numbers to barely hang on to this 2022-2024 election, which is still possible. And you have these winning issues. But if the Democrats don't engage in the culture war, it's over. Yeah. First of all, hi, Kurt. Um, I'll get to you in one second. But Dahlia just wanted to add something quickly to what Waj just said. I think I want to lash together something that you said and that Waj said that I think is really, again, one of these like incredibly boring um, sort of amorphous problems, which is that not that either of you are boring, but that this is, you know, fundamentally a democracy problem, right? This yeah. is a problem of a system that is working precisely as it was designed to work. And everything about the Electoral College, everything about the fact that we have five out of the six Republican appointees on the Supreme Court appointed by a president who lost the popular vote and then was ratified by a Senate that is so malapportioned that tens and millions of people have the same amounts of votes as, as like a handful of people, right, in Wyoming. This whole thing is structured to privilege white agrarian rule. That was mm. the bargain. And the bargain is working. Mm. And the fact that we're all looking around now and saying, wait, I voted, I voted, I showed up, I voted, and nothing is changing is because the system exists 
to suppress that vote. And then you have that Supreme Court where five of the six justices are appointed by minority majority president, ratified by a minority majority Senate. And they turn around, as you said at the beginning, and they constrict the vote. Yep. They constrict it in the Shelby County case. They constrict it last year in the Brnovich case. They constrict it in the partisan gerrymandering cases. So this is a perfect circle yep. that is operating to reify and cast in amber a minority rule system that has existed from the beginning. And for us who are all waking up and saying like, but wait, it's not one person, one vote. Wait, partisan gerrymanders are constitutional. Wait, states like Alabama and Louisiana just got blessed this term by the Supreme Court for such fantastically awful gerrymanders that are both you know, racist and, and absolutely uh, uh, reinforcing existing racial hierarchies. And we are like looking around and saying, but is the system broken? And my answer is always no, the system is working precisely as designed. And that's the double fight we have. This is a two front war. Because on the other side, Steve Bannon, if folks read Jen Sr.'s amazing profile of him, just wants to blow everything up. Right. And the nihilism is the point. And once the nihilism is the point, you bring in the wrecking ball and the cannons and the bazookas, there is nothing to fight for. Our side has to fight for two things. And you've both said this, but I think it's really essential. We don't want to have no institutions <laughs> because without institutions of democracy, right? We're in big trouble. And so you get into this horrific situation where we're all mad that Merrick Garland is trying to both like promote the independent Justice Department because there are institutional norms that matter. And he's not behaving the way Bill Barr did because Bill Barr didn't care about norms. He just cared about power. We're mad at the Senate that barely got Ketanji Brown Jackson confirmed while Josh Hawley was calling her a pedophile and the Dems just sat there and took it. But we're mad because we are in a two front war where we are trying to both prop up institutions and confidence in institutions. And we're also trying to make change. And I'm telling you, two front wars are really freaking hard when the other side just wants to blow everything up. And this is not me being a, an apologist for like mincing baby steps. And I totally agree with Brian that like we have failed utterly to message that you know, half the population <laughs> lost a fundamental right two weeks ago in a, an, an ahistoric, ill-conceived opinion that, by the way, and I'll end here, has Justice uh, Alito smugly saying, hey, you know what? If you don't like it, vote. Oh. And you know why he can say that? Because he's absolutely made it a point of honor to constrict the vote. He knows that getting out and voting doesn't solve for this. And so the only answer is to do both awful things, hold them in your head at once. The system is working precisely as designed. We have to work to fix the system. But if we want a constitutional democracy, the system is what we have. The alternative, as I've said to you before, Mary, is the army. That's not a good system. Yeah. Uh, so Kurt, we're having a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are. Just it's a, it's a depressing kind of fun um, because as Dolly just said, it's a two front war, but uh, it's a war we're fighting with both hands tied behind our back because of structural issues that Dolly also just uh, pointed to. Um, and because despite the fact that Democrats really, one, have so much going for them in terms of issues that are facing Americans and that should be motivating them to vote, uh, because of all the bad things Republicans are doing, and because Democrats genuinely, as a party, one, they're the only pro-democracy party, but they're, they, you know, they want people to have a living wage, they want the planet to survive, they want clean air and water and all of that, they want gun safety legislation, and yet, you know, we're in this situation where we're deeply worried about what will happen in the midterms, and it doesn't feel like, um, there's enough fight going on. Uh, in fact, I think in a way, it isn't so much that uh, people want Democrats to fight in a specific way. They just want to know that they're fighting, you right. know, uh, that they're willing to uh, stop pulling punches. Um, but we also uh, 
are fighting against, and I will, I think the Republican party is now, it's an enemy of democracy. Um, we're fighting against an enemy that has no scruples that right. has, that will lie, cheat, steal, uh, gaslight, uh, that won't play by any rules, which does make it, uh, does make it harder. So what can we do? And I do see, thankfully, I do see some candidates doing this. Like Tim Ryan is saying explicitly, I will get rid of the filibuster. You know, I will codify Roe. He's saying all of the right things. Um, but what else can we uh, do? Um, like we who aren't in, in positions of power, um, right. what, or what can we help people to understand that needs to be done without demoralizing them? Because I think some ways just focusing on how bad things are, <laughs> It, you know, it should be motivating, but it, then it, then you get to the point where it's just like, oh, for fuck's sake. I mean, there's just nothing <laughs> and you just kind of do that. Yeah, you know, it's, I was thinking to myself yesterday, you know, how we all got here, right? And and, and I think to myself, stolen elections are, are, are nothing new in America. And look at what happened in the year 2000 and think what would have happened if the shoe had been on the other foot. What would Republicans have done? had instead of bush gore going bush's way it had gone gore's way uh what would what they have done if the popular vote had been for w but gore somehow was declared president uh what we saw on january 6 is exactly what would have happened by the way uh, yeah. that that has always been within the republican party and we know that just because they conspired to suppress votes being counted in a free and fair election and literally stole the presidency in the year 2000 democrats as always put the country in the Republic first and, sur and effectively surrendered the presidency in the year 2000. And so much of that and, and so much of that DNA that's within a Democratic Party is exactly why we are where we are right now. Democrats will always do, quote unquote, the right thing almost to a fault. And we are at a point now where it's not enough to do the right thing. We are we are up against an enemy that has wreaked more havoc on our democracy than any foreign terrorist element could have ever hoped to have perpetrated on the United States of America. For all the talk about September 11th and the goal of Osama bin Laden, the goal of Al Qaeda, uh, which was effectively to, to wreak havoc and terror on freedom, that is exactly what the modern day Republican Party has morphed itself into. They are the American Taliban in the way that they function, in the way that they want to suppress women's rights and control other people and impose an extreme religious doctrine on the rest of us. It's like all of that is hallmark terrorist elements. Uh, if if what is going on in America was going on in any other country, if this happened in London or Paris or Spain, our media would call that terrorism. Yep. Our media would call that brutal dictatorship, authoritarianism, there, there would not be this, well, well, we got to call it both sides. We got to get both. I mean, the, the Canada just declared the Proud Boys a terrorist organization. What? We haven't yet. Right. Uh, like our media, and, and Waj touched on this needs a thousand percent, right, is woefully inadequate. Um, and, and frankly, our and, and we have, a, we have, a leadership problem and that leadership problem is is in my opinion it's more generational than anything else uh you know i came to washington dc in 2006 uh to work on capitol hill for a republican and the leadership in the democratic party when i came here in 2006 before there was twitter before politico was even launched for crying out loud it is the same leadership we have right now that is a problem that is not an indictment on the individual merits and accomplishments of Nancy Pelosi, Steny Hoyer, Jim Clyburn, et cetera. But the fact that we have literally the same institutional structure in 2022 that we did when I came here in 2006 is, is, a, is a, a failure of leadership. And, and that is to me, every fight, every war starts at the top. If you don't have the top right, you can't hope to get everybody else below that on the same page, marching the same direction, working and fighting the same fight. And the people that we have right now at the top came up at a time where there was at least the appearance of bipartisan. There were certain things you could at least work together on and believe that it wouldn't cost you your election. It was at a time where there weren't 
aggressive primary challenges to any incumbent really on either side of the ideological spectrum. It was a different time. And so much of what we see from the president, from our leadership, is this, this wanting to go back to that time as if we can, uh, as if it's attainable. And, and you know what? It isn't. And it isn't because of the Democratic Party. It's because the Republican Party has made a conscious decision to, to go to a place that we cannot meet them. Uh, I always say the reason why I can't reach out and compromise is because I, I, I can't reach out and compromise with someone who looks at me and sees the word China virus. I can't reach out and compromise with someone who tells me to go back to where I'm supposed to come from, which is Rochester, New York, by the way. Uh, you know, I, I can't compromise with someone who sees the world through that lens. Right. And so once we get to that point, the only alternative that we have is to beat them, is to crush them, is to make it so that them and anyone like them faces such consequence and lose everything that they see no profit in continuing down that path. And, and we have not, as a party, been able to really, I think, capture that the force needed to, to, to do that successfully because our leadership is still in, 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 in a different era. That's absolutely uh, true. And one of, one of the things that, that is uh, difficult to reckon with is that how, how is it we see it so clearly? I mean, there are Democrats running around with their hair on fire who understand precisely what's going on. How is it that they don't? Because again, um, it's not as if the Republicans are being nice. They're, they are, you know what? It's not even an asymmetrical warfare. The Republicans are waging war and the Democrats are saying, how can we work with you? And I, you know, instead of saying, Sorry, we can't make common cause with fascists. We can't make common cause with racists. We can't make common cause with people who believe that women should be second class citizens and 10 year old victims of rape and incest should be forced to carry that child to their you know, uh, embryo uh, to term or uh, who are perfectly comfortable with the number of children slaughtered in this country every year because their guns are more important to them, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I think, Waj, part, part of that, again, I think it's in some ways characterological with uh, democratic leadership. I don't, I don't know. Um, and uh, I think part of it is, um, is just not, Maybe it's maybe it's what uh, Dolly and I started out talking about. It just it's overwhelming. Where do you start? How do you, when you're so institutionalized in a way, yeah. figure out ways to work outside of what you're comfortable? With? It's like it's almost a case of functional fixedness. Um, but I think probably the most dangerous thing, and I've said this many times, so forgive me for repeating myself, is that by the media, by politicians, uh, by a lot of people who were just so fucking relieved that Donald was gone, uh, was this, this necessity almost of needing to pretend hmm. or convince themselves that the Biden administration was a normal administration that had followed another normal administration <laughs> and hooray, hallelujah, we can just go being back to normal. Um, so that's been one of the greatest disadvantages because then it allows, and again, I'm not suggesting at all that inflation isn't serious or that gas prices aren't serious, but Biden has no control over them. And yeah. compared to everything else we're facing, oh, and by the way, I would also just say that the best way to combat those things is with a living wedge. So Democrats <laughs> are the only party that that's good, it will do that for you anyway. But that normalization and that they did the same fucking thing with Donald um, normalized him completely. Like, you know, the media just hates this vacuum. So they had to normalize him as well. So that normalization allowed uh, for the this this atmosphere in which, you know, it's about inflation. 
versus, you know, we have different opinions on guns or whatever. And it's, I, it's another disadvantage we face. Actually, Kurt wanted to say something quickly and then watch. You can go yeah, sorry, I have to hop over to Peacock. Our dear friend Michael Steele is, ho is hosting Peacock. Uh, uh, then I'm going to hop on in a second. Um, I just want to say, <laughs> Mary, you made such a good point there. Um, I almost, and I want to draw the comparison. After Obama won, I feel like there are so many of us in this country, but, oh, we did it. First black president, right. everything's good. Right. We can all let our guard down and, and, and life will be great in America for here on, you know, forever. Post-racial democracy. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, the, the complete opposite. True. It's like how you go from Obama to Donald Trump is we can do a whole whole episode about that. Yeah. Uh, same thing, I, I think when Biden won, it's like, oh, Biden won. It's a return to normalcy. We're going to pretend, and by way, I mean the media in this case, like the last four years didn't happen. And we're going to hold President Biden to this standard that existed before Trump, which is complete bullshit, by the way, which is why they can get away with hiring a Mick Mulvaney or Chris Christie or, you know, Alyssa Ferris co-hosting The View every week. Oh. And, and, you know, they're doing their jam, whatever. But the, the, the fact that the media has allowed that to happen, um, you know, they are so complicit in the rise of this extremism and the extremism of the Republican Party. They have sent the message out to, to reward bad behavior. Anytime one of these traitors, and I use that word very deliberately, traitors, writes a fucking book, they're all over the goddamn television promoting it. They are given a seat at the table That's to right. talk to every single credible media outlet, the same media that they were dubbing enemy of the people, uh, fake news, alternative facts. They, they are allowed to promote that book and, and use the media to rehabilitate their, their reputation, to launder their sins through the modern day media ecosystem. Uh, and it's just such nonsense and bullshit. And so, uh, you know, what you said there, connecting Obama to Biden, to the media, uh, yeah. is something I wanted to throw in there. And yeah. with that, I turn it over to Wash, and I will see you on, on the other side, guys. All right. Thanks, Kurt. I really appreciate it. Uh, you know, I, people, Wash, I just want to add really sure, quickly, too. It's course. not just the traders uh, um, promoting their books all over the place. It's also the so-called journalists That's right. who kept back vital information in real time when it could have mattered uh, to write their fucking books too. So uh, people might not like what I'm about to say, um, but we I always this like what you have to say. Well, <laughs> yeah, many of the leaders in our institutions, in, especially the democratic leaders are not built for this fight and they're not made for this moment. That's just a reality. Mm -hmm. Biden, and we should still support Biden, even if he runs, support any Democrat who runs in 2024. But Biden was probably the right president to beat Trump. He's not the right president to beat Trumpism. And yeah. the, the leaders, like uh, uh, all the leaders mentioned, Clyburn, uh, uh, Steny, uh, Hoyer, uh, Schumer, Pelosi, they're not. Because there is something about institutional ossification and atrophying. I'm not talking about age. It's a right. mindset. And even within media, I can tell you, and Kurt can tell you, and Dahlia can tell you, many of these leaders, they're not built for this moment. They're just not. And they cannot adapt to this moment. They are creatures of an institution that, as Dahlia said, I want to say it again, because a very powerful point, is working exactly as it was designed to work for, for profit, for corporations, for white men, some white women. And so when they talk about the halcyon days of like, Oh, the Supreme, even Biden right now, the Supreme Court has 25% polling. And he's like, well, what do you want us to do? We can't expand the court. It's this hallowed institution. And you're like, dude, no one gives a shit about the Supreme Court. 25% of Americans respect it. What do you, this hallowed institution just took away 50 years of a constitutionally protected right is, and is, is literally engaging in a judicial coup. And when you, when they talk about like bipartisanship and they talk about the filibuster, what they're talking about is the good old days where these institutions, which we need, weren't that great for the rest of us. And these institutions, which we all agree we need, need to be reformed. That's right. But re reformation of the institution will make them uncomfortable. They're not used to this language. What are you talking about? I remember the good old days when I could talk to Mitch, my friend, share a glass of bourbon, pat him on the back. And he'd ask me about my wife and ask me about his wife. And we'd get the deal done. This is not that age. And the fact that even Biden and others are talking about rational Republicans while they are calling us pedophiles. Mary, I'm old enough to remember. If you used to call someone a pedophile, that used to be fighting words. But there was a Vice article that came out a couple of months ago, and I think it was April, 
where they were where they were just exactly what you said they were trying to figure out like what the democratic response to being called a pedophile was and vice concluded that the, the response of the leadership was do nothing right well do we nothing. heard eric swalwell hakeem jeffries i don't know if they recorded that article but they recorded somewhere saying you know we don't need to go there yeah you do you do need to go there <laughs> Um, or, or even Michelle, when Michelle's, you know, God bless Michelle, but the one thing that she said that that, that has killed Democrats is when they go high, you know, when they go low, we go high. I'm like, no, they'll take out your kneecaps. Uh, when, when they go low, you bear crawl, you put them in a submission, you choke hold them. Uh, and what people, you know, I'm not for violence as an analogy, by the way. What Kurt said to connect the last point is if you're up against a fascist movement, where they want minority rule and they're willing to burn down all the institutions or they're willing to use terror and intimidation to, 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 for you to seed the ground. That is an ongoing threat to our democracy. And you cannot rationalize it. You cannot normalize it. You can't bipartisan it. You have to use the power that we have right now, at least for the next five months, and you have to crush them. We have the Justice Department for right now. We have the White House, we have the House, we have the Senate, at least a 50-50 tie. I know Dahlia said it's an important point that it's malapportioned, that the 50 Democrats have 40 million, represent 40 million more people. But mm -hmm. you have to flex the power that you have for the next few months to give us just that chance, Mary. And I think the pressure that people put on Democrats and the leadership that we're seeing from, again, Pritzker, Newsom, AOC, and I gave another name, uh, I think Raskin, there's a, a Porter, Mm -hmm. uh, Mallory McMorrow, the Democratic Party needs to see that when these individuals put out the message, put out the fight, and they get like donations, and they get better uh, 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 social media followers, and they get on TV, they're like, oh, the base, that's what the base wants. So I want to end on a hopeful note in the sense that the majority is looking for fighters to rise up and meet the moment. The Democratic Party has that ability for the next few months. I don't think Biden is that guy, but then there couldn't be others around Biden who do the work, but they have to lift them up. As Brian was saying, like, where are the other Democrats? Who are they lifting up? Who are they nurturing? Who are they putting out there? And you see like them holding on to power like Charlton Heston, you know, take take this from my dead cold hands. And I just need some other leadership to step up right now. And whoever steps up from the Democratic Party and matches the passion and convictions of the people I've said this before, I'll say it again, will be politically rewarded in 2022 and 2024. Thank you for letting me feel a buster. No, and can I say, I want to say one other thing that I think is also hopeful. We're talking as though these ideas have not already been, like, there are amazing democracy reform groups yep. that are doing this. Yep. And like, folks should look up demand justice and folks should look up, you know, fix the court. And folks should look up Protect Democracy and the people at the Brennan Center and Mark Elias. And like there are groups that are working on filibuster reform. There are folks who are working on state compacts, you know, to, to get out of the electoral college stranglehold. There are folks working on, you know, bipartisan state reapportionment so that we can fix gerrymandering. Like all of this stuff is happening in the like, quote unquote, laboratories of democracies, which is the states. And so in addition to like, caring about your like states, you know, attorney general race and solicitor general race and the school board race and all that stuff. I think there are groups that are actually like decades into doing this work of fixing the filibuster and the Senate mm -hmm. and the Electoral Count Act, like all of that stuff, which sounds eye glazing is fixable. And it just requires fixing it and I think it requires because now we're sort of laying down track and the train is like literally like the train is not breathing down our necks because that is a mixed metaphor. But the train is coming faster than we can. And do it would this, be weird. This repair work. The smoke. I, the smoke is that's the, smoke the breath. Of the train yeah. is breathing down my neck. But I think what I'm trying to say is like this is not we don't have to invent the wheel here. And I think getting right. involved in like all of that democracy repair work instead of just saying my vote doesn't count. Like if you feel that your vote doesn't count, it's because you're in a state with a non-competitive election and that's fixable. And so I just yeah. think we have to really, really like not think it's this binary of democracy's broken and like these three people have just spent an hour telling me how broken it is. So like <laughs> I'm moving to Scandinavia. It's not that. It's that democracy yeah. is broken and it is eminently repairable. Yes. And that's the work we have to do right now. And in the meantime, we live with this like, kind of crap ass broken system that is now exposed in all of its flaws. 
and we vote. Yeah, and I, I want to go back quickly uh, to something Watch said that illustrates uh, the part of the problem. And well, it combines the things both of you were talking about. One, we know the system is working as it was uh, intended because despite the fact that Republican leadership has is, is been around for a long time as well, they're doing just fine. Like they they get it. So it's not about ageism. It's about um, understanding when the system is in your favor and taking advantage of it and when it's not in your favor and needing to fight. Uh, the Republicans, Republicans have gotten the message. <laughs> the Democrats have not. Um, all right, you guys, this is incredible. And for everybody out there, again, this is not to demoralize. This is to help us understand what's at stake. And um, what I'd like to do next time is talk about, because I, you know, this is another thing that, that's important. We all need to understand, including me, uh, what Democrats can do that they're not doing and what they can't do that they're getting blamed for not doing, even though they can't do it. Because I, I think that will also help people be less angry and also know where where to uh, where the pressure is can best bear if that's not even a thing that people say. But you know what I'm saying. Where we can most bring to bear uh, the pressure that needs to be put on people, and to you know to yell at people for not doing things they can't do is like is counterproductive. So I, I think that's definitely something uh, we need to discuss as well as you know we didn't even get to a whole bunch of the Supreme Court things and and we, or or the hearings, but. We're going to continue this. Uh, Dahlia Lithwick, Wajali, Kurt Bardella, Brian Karam, thank you. Uh, you are my my core nerd adventures. And um, I appreciate everything you do. And hopefully we'll see you next week. Or, or during another surprise hearing. All right. Thanks. See you soon. Well, thank you so much uh, to my amazing guests and thanks to all of you for being here uh, for the Mary Trump Show strategy session at its new time. Uh, just a reminder that we will be doing this every Tuesday from now on at 12 o'clock noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific at youtube.com slash Politicon. Uh, and of course, we will continue to have our Thursday show at its regular time, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific, also at youtube.com slash Politicon. While you're on Politicon's uh, YouTube page, please follow Politicon, like the episode, and don't forget to click the bell, uh, because if you do, um, you will be alerted every single time a new video drops. And that's not just our regular shows, but also short videos. And of course, if we have any other uh, hearings that will be live streaming, you can also listen to the show on Apple Podcasts or anywhere you listen to podcasts. And please give the show a five-star review because it really does help other people find the show. And, uh, you know, we want as many people to listen as possible. Uh, thank you again for being here. Thank you for all of your great comments. We so appreciate how engaged all of you are. And uh, we will see you Thursday, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. In the meantime, please stay safe and be kind. Um.